came Who, who is the first one? Abraham. Abraham. Second? Isaac. Isaac. Then? Jacob. Jacob. Then? Joseph. Okay, it is going to be a long march into the year 2009. Uh, so we will... Uh, now I'm thinking that um, maybe after we come back from Israel, we can still have two lessons before we wrap up the year. Yeah, I was just preparing and so on, but uh, I just didn't get the, the piece uh, to, to uh, break lesson. Next week will be our last lesson. I thought, ah, I cannot. You all be staff, you know. Uh, so next week we will continue, and then we'll go Israel for two weeks. So two Fridays, or no, two Saturdays off, and then we come back. We do two more before I take leave for the year. Okay, come, let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you once again. And we ask of you, Lord, even this morning, that you sow your truth into our hearts, into our minds. Lord, we want to learn from your grace and your mercy, your goodness, Lord. Everything that you have in store for us is not an afterthought, but it was something that you, you designed and you planned for, even right at the beginning. So, Lord, help us even as we continue to study now, even about your great servant, Abraham. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, last week, uh, chapter 11. As we ended chapter 11, we came to this uh, uh, place called Ur. You are Ur. Now, I, I didn't have uh, enough space in my bag, too many things to carry, but I would have brought a book, the pictorial uh, introduction to the Bible and so on. Uh, because when I first read about Ur through this book and, and so on, I find that, wow, Ur is not a run-down place. Ur was a very developed place. And it was the first place in history that had sanitary system. You think only in the year 2002 when your HDB was built, you had flush toilet and this and that. But uh, those days in Ur, they had very... I mean, it was simple, but they had a system where they could stay in their house and yet there was a system to flush, there was sewage and so on. So it was a very developed city, even at that point in time. I visited Corinth, um, uh, I think quite a few years, I mean about 10 years ago, uh, and I, I went to those places where during Paul, the Apostle Paul's time and so on, in the toilets, uh, quite advanced, no? better than our Kopitiam one. Kopitiam so dirty. Uh, they, they carve out of the, the, the walls of the, 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 the cave or something uh, seats, seats with holes in the center. And you can just, you know, one whole row, you can just sit and there's a hole in the center and then they have things that flush out through water system or something from the mountain flow. Um, then I, I went to Europe, visited some of the castles uh, in England and, and, and Spain and so on. And those castles also had a uh, water sewage system to, to dispose of human waste and so on. So we, we think that only in the 20th century or 19th century, uh, wow, then we have the American standard. But 
they were really quite advanced. So that was her. They were the first people to uh, uh, build this and use this uh, bathtub system. Okay, you think today we all relax, sweet, uh, sleep in the pool and so on. Uh. Uh, but they really had bathtub, they really know how to enjoy life, even those days in Ur. Okay, some of us don't even have bathtub, they got bathtub then. Now, in, in the midst of all this, the people in Ur, they were idol worshippers. Now, I want to I paint this background to you because then you understand about uh, uh, this, what's in it, Abraham. Abraham, before his name became Abraham, Abraham and his father Terah, they were idol worshippers. And I tell you, God spoke to Abraham and made him the, uh, the father of faith. And I tell you, if Abraham, being an idol worshipper, God called him, this election, elected him, if we all got hope, you understand? Huh? We got hope. So you turn with me to Joshua 24 verse 2. Joshua 24 verse 2. You remember last week we read that Terah, T-E-R-A-H, uh, was the father of Abraham, right? So Joshua 24 verse 2. 24 verse 2. While you are looking, let me just read from verse 1. And uh, for the newcomers, if for uh, old, old, old comers also, if I'm a bit too fast, uh, please raise your hand and stop me. Okay? Then Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua said to all the people, so fall them in, and he spoke to them. Then says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor dwelt on the other side of the river in old times. And I think that's a Euphrates river, I think. Huh? Say it? Yes, okay. Thank you. Um, and they serve other gods, idol worshippers. Then I took your father Abraham from the other side of the river and so on and so forth. But I just want to point to you, Terah, and his family including Abraham they were on the other side of the river and they were serving other gods okay that is the background so we just read chapter 11 Genesis uh, verse 31 and then we go on to chapter 12 this will give you that background and Terra if you want to sit here it's okay and Terah took his son Abraham and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, his son's his son Abraham's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan. And they came to Haran and dwelt there. Now, this man huh? It's really good, but it is a bit small for you, okay, to show you where is uh, Haran and so on. But there are some places which are quite important. Uh, later, if I would, if I can, I will try and uh, point to you. They just bear a name, Canaan, Haran, and so on. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now Haran was halfway between Canaan and Ur. So he wanted to bring his family from uh, where is this? From Ur to Canaan. But along the way, he didn't make it. So he died in Haran. Okay, chapter 12. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, I'm sure you've read this many times, but you underline the word had. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, When did God speak to Abraham? When he was still in the land of Ur. Okay? When he was still in the land of Ur. And that was the land of idol worship. Go 
God spoke to him. Get out from your get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. You notice God said get out of your land. land. Okay, your country. And then he narrowed down, he said, get out from your family. Because those family are very extended. Right yeah, you see uncle, uh, uh, niece, everyone is there. And then he finally said, get out from your father's house. So from country to family, and then from your father's house. And I will show you uh, to a land that I will show you. Why? Why did God want to take him out? You see, it is the doctrine of election. God, by His grace and mercy, He elected Abraham. And He wanted him to come out from these places, from the country, from his father's, from his family, and then from his father's house. Why? Because they must read, he must read himself off all this idolatry influence in order that he can serve God fully. And then we will read later on. Did he or did he not obey God fully? Did he obey God fully? No. Okay, we will read. So this is about election. So you turn with me, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Let me read from verse 8, 2 Timothy chapter 1. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our God, of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel according to the power of God who has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works Abraham at this point in time had not done anything for God you understand he had not he was still an idol worshiper but according to his own purpose and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began before time began God has chosen us yeah, according to his own purpose so you look back hey, you know uh, like for me I come from a, a family where my mom will do ancestor worship Taoist and so on and yet God chose me okay you look in your own background and so on I don't know you drop into a Methodist family a Presbyterian family or something I don't know but some people think that because they are born into a Methodist family they are Methodist for life no Okay, well you are fortunate but some of us we come from very tough background but God according to his purpose called us and we thank God for his grace and mercy another one Ephesians chapter 1 Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5 still about this doctrine of election some people have got issue with this doctrine of election Ephesians chapter 1 Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love That is what? Righteousness Having predestined us to adoption as sons sons of God by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved so we are all called according to his purpose so you and I have been elected we have been saved for a purpose so we should not be spectators we all have God God has a purpose for us yeah don't know seek him ask him okay so 
All this God had spoken to Abraham 25 years earlier when he was still in the land of Ur. And now we go on verse 2. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. You notice when he says blessing, I will bless those who bless you. So it is collective. But if you are against Israel, you are against the Jews, uh, God will take personal issue with you. Because he now comes down to, he did not say, I will curse them who curse you. But he said, I will curse him who curses you. You follow? Okay? So, he blessed Israel. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There are three things. There are three things that we want to note here, even as we read verses 2 and 3. Okay? Number one, it's preeminence. This is the grace of God. A preeminence means to make you great. And you notice it is I will, I will, I will. And this is the last week I gave you how many covenants? Seven or eight? Eight. The first one? Edenic. Second one? Adamic. Third one? Noah. Fourth one? Abrahamic. Okay, this is Abrahamic. And God will continue to uh, repeat this as we go on the next few chapters. Abrahamic covenant. And I said of all the covenants, uh, which one is conditional? Mosaic. Mosaic. Conditional. If you do this, I will do this. But all the other covenants are unconditional and unilateral. That means what? One direction only. And that's why we reach here. It is unconditional. This Abrahamic covenant, unconditional and unilateral. You see, I will. I will. I will. Until this point in time, Abraham has not done anything. It is the grace of God. So, to a land that I will show you, I will make you a great nation. I will make you a great nation. But at this point in time, Sarai was still what? Barren. Barren. Wow. You know, but God said, I'm going to make you a great nation. So this is pre-eminence. I will make you a great nation. And you compare that to uh, chapter 11 verse 4. Chapter 11 verse 4. One chapter back. And what were they doing? Chapter 11 verse 4. They wanted to make a nation for themselves. They wanted to make a name for themselves. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves. Then uh, it's pride. And you know, pride comes before a fall. And God came down and destroyed their works. But it is different when you see in chapter 12, by His grace, uh, He said, I will make you a great nation. Okay? And I will bless you. I will bless you. You know, until today, Israel is still a blessed nation. <laughs> Numerically, uh, they could not survive. No reason how they can survive. I know they were uh, rebirthed in, in, in May 1948 as a nation. But the, the enemies that they have around them, this is only a few million people, you know, five, six million. Yeah, surrounding them are a few hundred millions of Muslims who are anti-Christ. Numerically, they could have just gone in and just wiped Israel off the map. But you go and read the history, when we go there, they'll tell you more about the history, the Six Day War, the Yom Kippur War, and all these skirmishes and so on. And yet, today, Israel is still alive. 
You know why? Because God is their protector. Okay? That's why you need to listen to this Israel and the second coming. God is not done with Israel yet. He still has Israel still has a place in his plan. So second thing. And make your name great. That is identity. And make your name great. That is identity. Do you know uh, some of the most established, uh, uh, successful bankers in the world throughout history since uh, the last few hundred years? Uh, uh, who are they? Jewish. Rothschild, you know Rothschild? Yeah. All these are Jewish people. Good, successful bankers. Good with money. Yeah. Do you know some of the best inventions uh, are done by Jewish people? You know Einstein? Jew. Okay. Many, many of the things, even internet and the other things, uh, uh, you, you just go Google and you're going to uh, inventors, Jewish. Boom. So many things that we use in our daily lives, uh, they are done by the Jews. God has that special blessing upon them. Grant them wisdom and so on. And make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. You see, blessings when you receive them, you are not to keep them. You are to channel it to others. You follow me? Yeah? Then you become a channel of blessing because if not, then you just keep receiving. You are like the Dead Sea, you know, just stony. But you receive and you release. And that's why God said, and you shall be a blessing. Yeah? to others. Then he said, I will bless those who bless you. You see, USA, uh, uh, they got terrorism, the economic crisis, they got so many things and so on. But all through the years, this USA is still the number one super economic power of the world. Yeah, Simple. No money will bring money, that's all. Yeah. But they have been put in that position to be so-called the policemen of the world and so on. And God grant them favor. Yeah, along the way, yes, they, they have not really been uh, the Christian nation that God wants them to be. But God still blessed them. USA. Why? Because they support Israel. They will defend Israel. They will sell weapons to you, Israel and so on. And God prosper them. And our tiny red dot, uh, we are surrounded by, you know, yeah. yeah, and this is recorded, you know. Yeah. Uh, why are we prospering? We don't have natural resources. Yeah. Uh, we, we are militarily strong. We have enough uh, 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 defense, you know, all the NS men and, and all the planes and uh, to, to, to at least put up a good defense. When you look at our neighbors and so on, uh, highway not there, infrastructure not there, politically unstable and so on, uh, they can just actually overwhelm us. Uh, down south, they got, that is the largest Muslim nation in the world. How many hundred million people are there? Hadi? Um, 120 okay. If uh, they just send their boat people from Batam or Bintang uh, and just come, uh, I tell you, uh, we cannot build enough HTB for them. You understand? Uh? <laughs> but God protects us. Why? Because you're going to study the history of Singapore. Since the 60s, uh, we have been supporting Israel. We are working close in closely with them. So this is true. I will bless them who bless you as a nation. Okay? And I will curse him who curses you individually. Individually. But I can also raise one example of uh, in the case of Britain. Do you know Britain uh, was for the many years, uh, they, they said this is the empire that doesn't set the sun doesn't set on this empire because they've got empire, British empire colonies all over the world yeah, in Europe, in Asia, in South America everywhere they have so every moment the sunshine that is a British colony 
and they have always been supporting the Israelites those days uh, before 1948 during World War II and so on. they've been looking unto England to, to help them in their cause and everything and then after the war they wanted to establish a nation Ben Gurion the first uh, uh, Prime Minister of Israel but to cut the whole story short when they went to the United Nations hoping that Britain would support them uh, in the vote eh, Britain for some reason just did not and that was one crucial vote, no? did not no? because there, there were lots of opposition uh, uh, against uh, Israel don't want them to be re-established so England did not support do you know who has the vote no? that went in favor of Israel being established as the nation at the United Nation which nation? Russia. Russia you don't understand then you will know it is the hand of God this is a miracle yeah, when we study last week we came to the word Magog, Magog, Russia when you go all the way to Revelation Gog and Magog yeah, that is north of Israel, Jerusalem and that is the enemy or friend of Israel enemy yeah, 200 million army from the east and then enemy from the north Gog, Magog and so on but somehow through divine intervention Russia voted for Israel and Israel was established the point is what happened to Britain since then 1948 the em okay it's 11 o'clock okay the empire has been dissipating decreasing yeah uh, they, they lost I mean we are no longer under British colony in Malaysia also I mean the Commonwealth is getting smaller and smaller they they lost their empire yeah and you look at UK and so on uh, it is not the power that it used to be so this is true I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed underline all all includes Gentiles Gentiles and not just the Jews and in you all the families shall be blessed do you know we are children of Abraham okay I know your grandfather great-grandfather is Adam but uh, down the line I've got Abraham okay turn to Galatians chapter 3 Galatians chapter 3 7 verse 7 Galatians chapter 3 verse 7 therefore know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham are we not sons of faith we are so we are sons of Abraham you jump to verse 29 same chapter and if you are Christ then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise and where is that promise all the way back in Revelation and in Genesis so we are children of God okay we are of Christ and so we are Abraham's seed and so all this promise ours I will bless those who bless you I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed so the third thing is security I will curse him who curses you so even in this covenant with Abraham God had three things in mind for Abraham and his generation preeminence you shall be great identity your name shall be great security I will curse him who curse you that's why until today they cannot wipe Israel off the 2,000 years that Israel was away from their land is because of what God put them away in exile because they were disobedient 
and God said in His Word that He will bring them back. Okay, you read all the prophets in the Old Testament, He will bring them back. So, your question then is, uh, so why did God choose Abraham or the Jews? Why did He choose Abraham or the Jews? We need to know. Why not choose the Chinese? You know, Sinai, right? We read last week, Sinai. Okay, why choose Abraham? Okay, number one, to be a witness of God's way. Okay, why? To be a witness of God's ways. You read this in uh, Isaiah 49 verse 6. Isaiah 49 verse 6. Now I'm going to be slow in this chapter because this is important. This is the uh, the, the man of faith, the father of faith. So it's from here that the, 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 the rest is built. But of course the other important chapter, most important chapter is Genesis chapter 3. Yeah, for those who, who were not here, you can listen to the tape. But that, uh, Genesis chapter 3 is the most important chapter, you might say, in the Bible. Um, Isaiah 49 verse 6. Indeed, he says, It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob. Means if it is only Israel, if it is only Jacob, Jacob is Israel. The tribes of Jacob means stop referring to Israel. It is too small a thing that you should be my servant. Actually, this passage here, this chapter here is talking about, prophetically about Jesus Christ. Yeah. To raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. So even as God was speaking prophetically about the Messiah who is to come. It is a reference to the people of Israel. So Israel is too small. You are to be the light to the Gentiles as well. But of course you know along the way the Jews uh, did not fulfill this. They did not. So we the Gentiles, we born again, we bring the light to the world. Okay? So, that's number one. Number two, to be a keeper of God's word. Keeper of God's word. Because the word was first released to who? Jews or Gentiles? Jews. Jews. So they're supposed to keep. And until today, uh, when you go to Israel, you see, they are quite holy. Eh? They keep the word on their head, in the box, they keep it on their hand, and on the doorposts, and so on. Uh, but you see, that, that is the Mosaic Covenant. Because the eighth covenant we studied, uh, we mentioned last week, the glorious new covenant, where is the word? In our hearts. Okay? In our hearts. Okay, so, Romans chapter 3, verse 12. Romans 3, verse 12. Okay, let me see. Uh, verse 2, verse 2. Sorry, sorry. Romans 3, verse 2. One of these days we must study Romans. Romans is a wonderful book. Okay. I got frightened by a, as a young Christian, I got frightened by a senior Christian. Don't read Romans. Romans is very tough. <laughs> Rubbish. Okay. So don't get all this kind of uh, thing. Much in every way, chiefly because to them, the Jews, uh, were committed the oracles of God. Okay, you want to be sure it is the Jews, you read verse 1. What advantage then has the Jew, or what is the profit of circumcision? Circumcision refers to the Jews, right? 
much in every way, every way, not just some, chiefly because, mainly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Oracles means these are the sayings, these are the scriptures of God. So, they were supposed to be the keeper of God's word. Which they do. Which they do. But more than that, uh, they are the multiplier of God's word. You look at the Pharisees and the scribes, uh, they added volumes to, to the thing. And that became a bondage to the Jews. This cannot do, that cannot do. And then the last one is to be a channel of God's wonder. To be a channel of God's wonder. W, the W, the W. Okay. This one, too many references, but you know, to be a channel of God's wonder means what? Through the line of the Jews. To be specific, through the line of Shem. Right? Shem, right? Not Ham, right? Ham, Africa. Then, uh, Japheth is what? Europe. Hey, you forgot. <laughs> yeah. So, your which line are we from? China, the China one. <laughs> ham, Ham. Okay, that's why we all eat pork. Okay? <laughs> so, we are from the line of Ham. But, God's line, I mean, through, through Jesus' line, okay, through the line of Shem came down. Yeah, then Abraham, and then as we go down, Moses, and then you go quickly down to King David, and God's covenant with David, the Davidic covenant is through your line, there will be one that will rule forever with the iron scepter and so on. That is talking about our Lord Jesus. And through that line came to our Lord Jesus. You read that in Matthew chapter 1. Yeah. To be a channel of God's wonder. It's a wonder because the, the, the incarnation of God as man. Yeah, God became man yeah, so that man through Christ can become children of God. Okay? Son of God became son of man so that the sons of man can become sons of God. Okay, so these are the three reasons why God chose. You ask why? Don't know. This is the doctrine of election. God chose according to his purpose. So don't go and spend time arguing with non-believers, atheists and others. Uh, uh, why this one thing? God chose him. You don't uh, agree and you ask God. Uh, okay? His number is 1-800-G-O-D, you know, we'll call it. <laughs> Okay, so this is the background. I, I spent about 45 minutes on this because this is important. So knowing this, and then so you are Abraham. I'm an idol worshipper. You know, I listen to all this that you said, and this was when I was still in, in the land of earth. Hey, easy to believe, not easy to accept. Not? How many times people share the gospel with you, then you receive? How many first time? First time. People share with you straight away. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I've been waiting for this all my life and come, you know, go to church with you. First time. No, right. I was smart Alec, I argue with them in, in university and da 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 da. Then I met a gangster more tougher than me. No, actually it's Pastor Tay's good friend. <laughs> he more gangster than me, so I okay, okay, I believe. Not easy, right? But you see verse 4. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And so Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. That what? That tells me he chose to believe. He chose to believe. He could have just rejected this. But he chose to believe. So Abraham departed. And this was 25 years later. Because 25 years earlier, he was in Ur with his father and so on. And then after that, the father took the whole family wanting to go, go to, uh, uh, where is it, Haran. No, he, uh, Canaan, then died along the way Haran and so on. 25 years later, then it was time to go. So sometimes, uh, in fact not sometimes, 
many times between the promise and the performance uh, there is a gap so sometimes you you hear the word of god and you think it's now you know wow there is a timing god has his timing so abraham departed okay let's turn to romans chapter 4 verse 11 Romans 4.11 And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith, which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, that they are though they are uncircumcised that righteousness might be imputed to them also you know paul's uh green are very champion so sometimes you must analyze a bit okay when did abraham receive that seal of righteousness while he was circumcised or uncircumcised uncircumcised that means before before he believed where was he when he when he was an unbeliever he was in the land of Ur. okay so when he was an, an unbeliever uncircumcised he received that seal so now we read and he received the sign of circumcision which is a seal of the righteousness of the faith for which he had while still uncircumcised that he might so that he received this so that he can be something right that he might be the father of all those who believe we are all just now we read galatians chapter 3 verse 7 he's the father of all those who believe though they are uncircumcised that righteousness might be imputed to them also last week we studied what did abraham do to get his righteousness nothing it was imputed upon him by god's grace god imputed righteousness upon him so likewise for us huh noah okay noah okay, okay. my apologies you think my students are uh, so good okay likewise we have the righteousness imputed upon us not of any works that we have done so all abraham did back to genesis chapter 12 was he believed and he departed because if he did not believe he could have just stayed in haran go back to earth but he departed and you read uh, hebrews 11 let's listen to hebrews 11 verse 8 hebrews 11 this is the chapter of faith everything is about faith Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8 to 10 and he went out not knowing where he was going by faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country and you read and so on for he waited for the city which has no which has foundations whose builder and maker is god right we will come back to this later but i just want to tell you the word is so simple so abraham departed but when he left huh, he did not know where he was going he was in a foreign country but he knew that was the land of promise and he was waiting for the city whose whose foundation yeah uh, the foundation whose builder and maker is god if you come back to hebrews 11 verse 8 uh, later so verse 4 chapter 12 so abraham departed as the lord had spoken to him Okay, let's look at one more isaiah 30 verse 18 isaiah 3018 
I said there were 25 years, right? Between hearing and departing. Sometimes it is because uh, we choose to wait. Yeah? We are not so urgent in responding to the call. And if you are in that position, God has spoken to you before and you are waiting. It's okay. Isaiah 30 verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Remember I preached this uh, watch night service last year. Waiting on God. Okay. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. And therefore he will be exalted and he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. Sometimes you are just waiting on him, waiting for him. Sometimes he is waiting for you. Who is waiting for who? Yeah. But in any case, God will be gracious upon you. So, back to Genesis 12. So, Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lord went with him. And Lord went with him. Is there anything wrong here? Because in verse 1, God said, Get out of your country, get out from your family, and get out from your father's house. Hey, who is Lord? Lord is the niece. Nephew. 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 <laughs> nephew. And he, he's going to bring him lots of problems. <laughs> so partial obedience is not obedience. Yeah, there will be consequences. So, and Lord went with him. And Abraham was 75 years old when he departed Haran. He was 75 years old. Take note of all these ages and because later on then you will know how old was he when he became a father, Sarah, you know. What about Ishmael and how old was Ishmael? Uh, I mean, how much older was he compared to Isaac and so on? <laughs> okay, so what we see here is the beginning of the pilgrimage of Abraham. Everywhere he went, he was a pilgrim. Everywhere he went, did he build houses, build bungalows? What did he build? Altars. Okay, he pitched ten, but he built altars. So one thing we can learn from this, huh? yeah, don't need to go around uh, 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 buying this property, buying that property as if uh, you're going to live here forever. If that is your business, so be it. But if not, uh, no need to go and buy one property here, buy next launch you go and buy another one, yeah, because we are in the world but we are not of the world we are only passing through okay because you can only sleep in one house on one bed at one time right you don't sleep two hours here get out sleep another two hours there okay so are we we are pilgrims and this is important first peter chapter 2 first peter chapter 2 verse 11 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11 Because we are seeds of Abraham So we can learn from Abraham Beloved, I beg you That's what the Apostle Peter said I beg you as sojourners Sojourners that means what? Pilgrims Journey, journeyman, journey Sojourners and pilgrims Abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. So Apostle Peter was writing uh, to the church and he said, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims. So the Apostle Paul identified and described the early church as sojourners and pilgrims. And that's what we are. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Okay? So back to Genesis 12. So again, I repeat. Huh? Abraham's call gives us hope. Because if God can call an idol worshipper 
in the land of idol, idolatry and so on, hey, we got hope. We are not so bad, we don't worship idols. Eh? Yeah. Okay. And Abraham believed. This passage here is important. All these are important. And he believed. He believed because he was elected. Not he was elected, therefore he believed. Okay. What am I saying? We believe because we are elected. Not the other way around. You follow me? We believe because we are elected, not the other way around. Verse 5. Then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lord, his brother's son. Of course, uh, when, when God told Abraham, uh, get out from your family, from your father's house, uh, should he come out alone? If it was full obedience, uh, should he come out alone? Is it? Cannot. Then where go Isaac? <laughs> Must bring the wife. But Lord, no need. Okay. <laughs> then Abraham took Sarai, his wife, and Lord, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people whom they had acquired in Haran, and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. Again, why he going to bring all the people, bring all the possessions? Eh? No need. Because God said what? I am going to make you a great nation. You got nothing. Your wife is better. I'm going to make you great. Yeah, I'm going to bless you. So if God is going to bless you, why you bring all this possession? And you bring all these servants. Yeah, all these people. But I'm very sure that when he left Haran, he must have been mocked. Just like Noah was mocked when he went around building the barge and the ark. No rain or what was this thing? What are you building? You know? Ur is such a well developed place, got, got sanitary system, got bathtub, got every I mean it's developed compared to other places. Why are you leaving uh, Singapore to go to South India and live in the remote jungle? For what? You know? But he believed. So sometimes when God calls you, uh, you have to take the step of faith. And though people may mock you, and I thought, I'm sure you must have heard this many times from pastors, now when we wanted to build this uh, cathedral, his good friends and so on, and I know who they are, you know, don't put the church to shame. You will embarrass us, you will bankrupt the church. Okay. Today they are looking for church, and they don't have church. Today they are still worshipping in, in hotels and so on, and they want to buy land. So they will call pastor to go and preach to them. Okay? <laughs> so, don't worry about naysayers. And they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. Remember we read Hebrews chapter 11 verse 8, they went not knowing where they, where they were going. Yeah. And those days got no MRT, no train, no nothing. And it was really a human effort. To go and so that is perseverance. Abraham, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Sechem as far as the tabernacle tree of Moreh, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Of course, right? who else stays in Canaan? Canaanites, are. but later on. As we go on to the book of Joshua, you find that Joshua went to uh, destroy. God told him to destroy. No, he killed all men, women, and child in the land of Canaan, animals also. And I tell you, many people are questioning this. Your God, now you say your God is a God of love. How can he allow all this? It is not. It is mercy. It is mercy. Because if you go and study, which we will as we go along, you go and study the practices in, in the land of Canaan. Uh, they worship other gods. And one of them is Molech. And Molech is uh, child sacrifice. And so this statue will be, uh, this iron statue will, will have arms like this. Okay? And they will raise the temperature, burn this steel structure until it is super, super hot. And in order to appease their gods, they will put babies uh, born in this house, yeah, to sacrifice to their gods. 
amongst the many other things that the, the, the people in Canaan do. And if you remember Genesis chapter 6, every intention, everything that was on their mind was evil. And God was so upset with them that He brought the flood and all were destroyed. Okay? But God said, I will not destroy the earth with flood again. So when he, the Canaanites, uh, when Joshua went to the land of Canaan, he said, destroy them. Okay? Why? Because this should not propagate down. Because if the Jews were to go in and they mix with them, that's why God was so strict. Do not intermingle with them. Okay? And so destroy all the Canaanites. Okay, we will come to that yeah, after Genesis. And the Canaanites were then in the land. Verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your descendants, okay, this is elaboration, okay, still part of the Abrahamic covenant. Still part of the Abrahamic covenant. Earlier on we saw, we read that to, the, to a land that I will give to you. So he said, To your descendants, I will give this land. Again, you notice, I will, I will, I will, unilaterally. I will give this land. And later on, we will see what the, where the land is. Huh? And there he built an altar to the Lord. Not house, huh? altar. Who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel and pitch his tent with battle on the west and I on the east. So, battle, I. So he pitch his tent somewhere here. Battle on the west, I on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south so if you can see this map huh? okay. if you can see this map uh, I know you, you, you have to scrutinize bring binoculars next week huh? um, this is the Mediterranean Sea okay this is Egypt so he started from uh, Ur which is somewhere here so he went up and after that he went down okay and then uh, I and and uh, whatever is here later on in the next chapter then he will go into Egypt okay so it's up down and I believe some of your study Bibles uh, would have maps you just follow when you read uh, when you read try and refer to the maps in your study Bible like I have it here yeah it makes your understanding clearer so Abraham journeyed going on still toward the south so we observe one thing everywhere that Abraham went he was a worshipper important everywhere he went he was a worshipper and a pilgrim or you can say a pilgrim and a worshipper but remember that is Abraham everywhere he went he built an altar. Everywhere he went, he did not stay. So he was a pilgrim. He was a pilgrim and worshipper. Verse 10. Now, altar, before I go on to verse 10, altar speaks to us. I mean, why, why build an altar? Why build an altar? It speaks to us of what? Sacrifice. And why is there a need to sacrifice? For atonement. Atonement for what? Sin. Yeah? And also as a form of thanksgiving unto the Lord for promising Him, blessing Him, watching over Him. I tell you, when you are in, like last time you did the word at, right? Pastor in one of the paragraphs said that uh, many of us are uh, we only come to God and pray uh, when we have problems. Yeah? After problem resolved, goodbye till the next problem. Right now. But when you are in a 
problem, when you are situation, when you are lost, uh, you depend on God much more. You search. So, I believe that was a similar situation with Abraham. Because he went to a land, he didn't know where to go, eh, so he better uh, fix the IDD line. Yeah, make sure the connection is right. You tell me where to go, I go. So everywhere he went, he was a worshipper. So that is the altar. Okay? Now, verse 10. And now, verse 10 onwards, uh, um, it shows the transparency of the Bible. The Bible doesn't hide anything. And only tell you the good things of King David. But it also tells you about the bad things of King David. Yeah, didn't only tell you the good things of Paul, the missionary, but also tell you he was a persecutor. His name was Saul. Okay, And here we see, wow, Abraham believed and he departed. Father of faith and so on. But now uh, we see uh, he got himself into some trouble. Okay. So it's quite typical. So we are no super saints. Uh. Along the way, we also make some mistakes. That's why, uh, thank God, he's a God of grace. Verse 10. Now, there was a famine in the land where he was, okay, before he went into Egypt. So he was here, this area, okay. So he went this way, uh, there Egypt is here. The Mediterranean Sea is here. So, there was a famine. And you know, in life, huh, there will be tests and this is a test just like Adam and Eve they were given a test of obedience they failed this is a test famine okay there was famine in the land hey but how come huh? God said I will give you this land no this is the promised land how come in the promised land God Famine. Yeah? Yeah. A few verses earlier you say you give me this land, you bless me, and so on. The moment I come to this place, I think of famine. It is a test. Okay, it is a test. And Abraham went down to Egypt to dwell there. For the famine was too severe in the land. So he went to Egypt. And it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is your wife, and they will kill me. But they will let you live. Please, say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. You read this before? Yes. Abraham uh, got to be slapped. Uh, he must attend my PMC. Uh. <laughs> he is more concerned for his safety than a chastity. Right? Because in those days, uh, the culture is A, hey, if you are the husband uh, and we want your wife, uh, the husband, two tigers cannot be on the same mountain, right? So a big tiger, a small tiger, they will kill you and they will take your wife. So see, you are my sister. So that I may live. Right? That's the bottom line, right? Okay. Cannot. You must stand for your family, for your wife, okay? Now, did Abraham do the right thing by going from here to here? But here got famine, right? He was supposed to stay Okay. I read this many times. Did he ask God for direction? He on his own uh, went to Egypt. So in your walk with the Lord, uh, if there be occasions that uh, you don't know what to do, uh, don't do. Don't know whether go or don't go, don't go. You follow me? Don't do it on your own initiative. Why? Because I'll show you an example then. Egypt, remember we studied, it is a picture of the what? Egypt is the picture of the world. Never. Okay. But in my many other sermons I mentioned before, right? It's a picture of the world where there is idolatry and, and everything. 
whenever the Bible refers to Egypt, even you read Isaiah and all the Old, Old Testament, when you refer to Egypt, it is always worldliness. So he believed, a believer, and he went into the world without checking with God. But there was another occasion when two people were told by God to go to Egypt. Ah, correct, correct. Okay, you turn to, uh, let me see, uh, there are quite a few in, in the New Testament. Uh, let's turn to Matthew chapter 2, since we did Matthew. Matthew chapter 2. Verse 13. Matthew 2, 13. Now, when they had departed, now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee to Egypt, and stay there until I bring you word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. Joseph and Mary were told to go. But was he told to go? No. He went on his own and he again get himself into trouble. Okay? So, when you don't know what to do, wait on the Lord. Don't compromise. That's what, that's what Abraham did. He compromised. The other thing, the other thing, um, Whenever you read the Bible, it is always saying, going down to Egypt. But when the Bible talks about going to Jerusalem, it's always what? Going up to Jerusalem. Yeah, going down to the world, but going up to the city of peace, Jerusalem. These are the words that are used in the Bible. Just additional knowledge for you. So, this is a test. And you know, uh, God never promised us a run of prosperity. Some people say, well, once you become a Christian, it's going to be a bit of roses. Now. Everything points skywards. Now. Everything is going to be good. No. no bad things will happen to you. Uh, no, lah, He didn't promise you that. Finally, he, His grace will be sufficient for you when you go through tests. Okay? And we will see how good, merciful, and gracious is our Lord. Did Sarai obey her husband? Ah, she did. Good wife. Good wife. She obeyed. And because she obeyed her husband, God protected her. God blessed her. So the same thing is some of you wives are having a tough time at home. Huh? Look unto Sarai. Yeah. God in his mercy will bless you, will protect you. We will see. Okay? Now, okay, let's look. Uh, verse 11. And he said to Sarah, Indeed, I know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Yeah? And later on in verse 14, the Egyptians saw the woman and said that she was very beautiful. How old was Sarah at this point in time? Okay, okay. Let's try. Huh? Uh, how old was uh, okay, Abraham? Uh? 75. 75. And Sarah is how much younger than? Huh? How much younger than the uh, husband? How do you know? Okay, everything must be interpreted by Bible, right? Okay, Genesis 17, 17. Genesis 17, 17. I can't wait to come to Genesis 17 because then I will tell you uh, the significance of the name Abraham to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, what it means. Yeah, but never mind, you be patient. If I don't do it before Israel, I'll do it after Israel. <laughs> Genesis 17, 17. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Why? Because uh, he was told your wife uh, is going to have child. 
and said in his heart, he dare not say out loud, because he's a father of faith, one. but God knows what is in your heart, okay? Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? So, difference is there. So, she is 65. Hey, beautiful, eh? Yeah. <laughs> uh, no Botox, no nothing. God is good, okay? Okay. And then he, verse 12, Therefore it will happen when the Egyptians see you, that they will say, This is your wife. Uh, and they will kill me because uh, and, and they will kill me but they will let you live but please say that you are my sister that one uh, true or not true true it's half truth half truth it's not the full truth first of all he married her so Sarai is his wife, that is the truth. But to say this is my sister is half truth. Not totally wrong because we studied the line of Shem after the flood. Yeah, and then from there you see the family. They actually married within the family. So to say you are my sister, not wrong. But half truth is not truth. Half truth will bring problems. Yeah, so lesson to learn is don't tell half truth. Tell the truth. Okay? It will bring problem. So this is of the flesh. Yeah. But I thought he's a believer. You know, I thought got the promise of God. But we all are uh, sometimes holy holy also sometimes take a break. Yeah, he took a break. And uh, to save his own skin, this is called deception. Deception. And you know like father like son that's why we, we must we must uh, we, we must be exemplary we must be god fearing we must be right before god so that our children when they look at us uh, when they look at us this is the model okay um, i just interviewed one couple on on, on uh, uh, thursday preparing them for wedding yeah and they all must hand up assignment books and I always read through the assignment books before uh, I interview them. And I, I called I, this couple in and I spoke with them. I said, you are good. After so many years of PMC, uh, 10 over years, uh, I read the book. Very seldom uh, I read someone who writes there, my father is the best father in the world. Usually a father is absent, father is this, father is da, da, da. But he said, my father is the best father in the world. I said, oh, that's good. Why? Because this is God fearing. Okay, this is being exemplary. So, but if you are a deceiver, he runs in the family. If you are a murderer, he runs in the family. You know King David? Murderer, right? Down the family, Absalom and all those also murdered, right? He was a uh, adulterer. Yeah? Down the family, also a lot of uh, uh, sexual sins and, and everything runs in the family. So our friend here, Abraham, he deceived, he said, half truth to me. Do you know down the line, uh, there was a very great deceiver. Who is he? Jacob. 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 We will come to Jacob again. He was a great deceiver. But finally he met his match. His uncle was a greater deceiver than him. <laughs> okay? So, um, whether fathers or mothers, uh, let's be good examples otherwise the children they learn the wrong thing okay so and you can also compare this uh, with Peter uh, Peter the first preacher of God's word yeah the leader so-called of the early church Apostle Peter hey, but before then uh, he denied Christ how many times three times so sometimes uh, you're up there and then you drop a bit but by his grace he pick you up Okay, so it's okay, it's okay. Uh, God is, is, is not true with Abraham yet. So verse 14, So it was when Abraham came into Egypt 
that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful uh, not just beautiful very beautiful okay. the princess of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh and the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house he treated Abraham well for her sake Wow, he collected dowry, no? <laughs> he collected dowry, really, you see, you look at all the dowry. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. Eh, these are luxury items, because those days, uh, it's like giving you houses, uh, because you are a farmer, you are agriculture, they give you all this, uh, that means you are wealthy. Yeah, if today you give me house, give me bungalow, wow, that, that is today's terms, uh, assets. And in his mind, uh, he, he might think, uh, wow, the Lord bless me, man. <laughs> First, I come down to Egypt, then I don't tell the truth, and I'm still blessed. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, sometimes, uh, some people, uh, they, they over-spiritualize things. Uh, they think whatever they are doing, though out of the will of God, uh, still get blessing. Praise the Lord. Hey, read on, read on. It's not, it's, this is uh, not permanent. Okay? So, verse 9. Uh, verse 17. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh uh, and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abraham's wife. If I were Pharaoh, huh? I love Motin Tin. You understand? Huh? <laughs> it's not my fault, it's Abraham's fault. Why you plague me and not him? But the Lord plagued Pharaoh. It is the goodness of God. Because according to his purpose. Okay? So let's look at this one you you you, you must have memorized because uh, i was asked to memorize when i was a young christian okay, but anyway first corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. first yeah no temptation has seized you except what is common to man yeah, but when you are tested god will provide a way out that you can stand up under it right first corinthians 10 13. so for all the new christians and and uh people who haven't read under corinthians then, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. So whatever temptations you are going through, you have. It's common, not, not nothing new. Okay, it's either lust of the eye, lust of the flesh, pride of life. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. He's talking to who? Believers or non-believers? Believers. Believers. So you will not be tempted beyond what you can, are, are able. But with the temptation, will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So God will still give you an exit door. Yeah. It's whether you want to exit or not. Okay. will still give you an exit door. That is His mercy. So, back to Genesis. So, okay. You have not gone according to my will, but still, because of Sarai, not because of Abraham, because of Sarai. So, all the ladies here, if you are not having a good time, it's okay. God knows your situation. So, God protected Sarai because of Sarai. So, first thing, God protected Sarai. Yeah, even as Sarai submitted to her husband, she could have objected. She could have objected, no, I'm your auntie, you know. <laughs> okay, okay, you say I'm your sister, I'm your sister. Okay. So for submission, God protected Sarai. Verse 18. And Pharaoh called Abraham and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here is your wife, take her and go your way. You know, it is humiliation to be rebuked by a non-believer. Paul in the New Testament say, hey, don't go to court. Why should you, uh, believers, a uh, believer and believer go to court? Why should you let unbelievers judge you? Because in the last days, uh, in the new kingdom, uh, we will be judging them. 
So why should we let them judge us? But here you see the father of faith, uh, Kana scolding, Kana review, Kana slapped by an uh, unbeliever, by the Pharaoh. Humiliation. So sometimes we get ourselves into trouble and then we end up in court, uh, end up in this, uh, it's because of our stupidity. Okay? Disobedience. But anyway, he, Abraham ate humble pie. So quietly he went. Hey, but good, he don't have to return the dowry, you know. You know, nah? <laughs> he kept all. Of course, later we read, nah? he was rich in livestock. You come, chapter 13. Oh, this hero is so generous. Nah? Okay, I'll keep the dowry, take back your wife, okay? Verse 20. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had and all that he had so all that were with him all the camel the oxen and all go god prospered them god prospered the family so through her submission through her submissive uh, uh, behavior towards her husband god protected her Okay, God protected Sarah and God prospered the family. God prospered the family. These are the two things uh, that you can take from this passage here. So, wives, be long suffering, continue to pray for your husband if he's unbelieving, whatever. Yeah, or living in disobedience, though he's a believer. Yeah, continue to trust God. God will protect you. God will prosper your family. They sent him away with his wife and all that he had. So, Sarah indeed is a model of the Christian wife. She is. Uh, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. Verses... Uh, 5 and 6. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves being submissive to their own husbands so peter was saying in the older times uh, the women is submit to their husband and then he mentions specifically one person as sarah obeyed abraham calling him lord small l uh. so don't worship your husband like big l okay? <laughs> whose daughters you are so all of us are seeds of abraham but for the ladies, uh, you are daughters of Sarah. She is your model. Okay? Um, whose daughters you are, if you do good and are not afraid with any terror. Conditional, if you do good. If you do good, then you can be like Sarah. Okay? So that is a picture of the christian wife now but before we leave this chapter we still want to look a little bit further about uh, abraham disobedient went down to egypt and yet uh, god still protects him and sarah they are still patient with him you look at psalms uh, 103 verse 10 Psalms 103 verse 10 Bless the Lord, O oh my soul This one we know, we sing so many times Psalms 103 For I like verse 10 Verse 10 uh, gives me hope Give me second chance and third chance and fourth chance and so on he has not dwelt, dealt with us. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punish us according to our iniquities. 
Because if he had, uh, you and I should be at Calvary, you know? right? Not Bethesda. We will be at Calvary. You know? we, will be on, we should be on the cross. But he has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. God could have given him a big review. You uh, go down and tell lies. But God uh, chose to use the Pharaoh to scold him. He has not dealt with us according to our iniquities. Okay, uh, let's look at another one. Um, why? Because we are his friends. Yeah, we are his friends. Abraham is his friend. So you turn to Isaiah 41 verse 8. Isaiah 41 verse 8. Isaiah 4 1 verse 8. Israel uh, had not been the best in terms of obedience. Um, they even have strayed. Before you read the book of Isaiah, you know in, in kings and in judges and so on, they also strayed and worship idols and so on, right? But here in Isaiah, God said, But you, Israel, are my servant. Of course, yeah, I'm your God, you are my servant, you serve me. Jacob whom I have chosen Jacob refers to Israel I have chosen we just read Abrahamic covenant okay the descendants of Abraham my Penyo, my friend yeah you are all my friends yeah in you whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called from the furthest regions and so on and so forth yeah I just want to point to you that you are my friend so Abraham though he went down south and so on but God said you are my friend okay one more one more uh, he that uh, we can look at is Psalms 105 105 Psalms 105 I hope you don't mind all this cross-referencing and so on, but it brings out all the nuggets that we can. Otherwise, you just simply read. Uh, you, you miss a lot of things. Because the Bible is to interpret the Bible, so cross-referencing is good. Psalms 105, verse 14 and 15. This one, Pastor quotes uh, now and then, okay, but with good reason. Psalms 105 verse 14 He permitted no one to do them wrong Yes, he rebuked kings for their sakes Saying, he, he's telling the kings God is telling the kings Do not touch my anointed ones And do my prophets no harm So God must have spoken to the Pharaoh Okay Do not touch my anointed one Who is my anointed one? Abraham yeah, and his wife Sarai and do my prophets no harm so God will protect his anointed ones so let's not be so free uh, in, in, in our words and criticism and, and so on Lord forgive us you know sometimes we we, we criticize the, 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 the pastor the preacher the evangelist the this the that and everything okay but God has called these people according to His purpose and He will protect them. Okay? So you see in this case, Abraham and Sarai, they were protected. So with that, we finish chapter 12.